Ooh, so welcome also from my side. Um, I would like to talk today or to show you some things about Wanderlust. I found out uh, that, that it's a German word. It's, a, it's the passion for walking, for hiking, whatever. But I found out that around 1900, so 120 years ago, it was adapted also in the English language. And it exists in this way, written like this, also in Italian, in the Danish language, and in Irish as well. Surprise, surprise. But um, it came to all of this because of uh, a German movement talking about 1900, the romantic times with painters like here Caspar David Friedrich. But I want to talk also about what does it mean to the Germans? I mean, it's not a word that we particularly use very often, but what is this thing that the Germans have to go spazieren gehen or that we like to go outside so much outdoor activities? What is the background? What is the history? Uh, what are the roots of it? So I would like to introduce you through a little journey through German and all our history and what it has to do with nature and why it is important to us as well. So uh, at first I would like to give you a translation or use a translation. It's not my one, it's the one of Wikipedia that says Wanderlust describes the desire to hike and the constant inner drive, inner drive, to discover nature and the world on foot away from or even close to home. That's absolutely right, because you don't have to walk up into the Himalaya to fulfill this desire. So let's have a look. I will use some paintings from that period I was talking about, the 1900. So the music, the art, the literature, kind of romantic way. It was the time of the English gardens, of the parks that we have in our big cities and this was the ideal scenery for the people sure more or less for the aristocrats that means for the people that could afford it the other lived in uh, wooden huts or in uh, districts that were not so nice looking but this was the beauty everyone admired and by our genes by our background deep deep inside of us we still in our days if i if you show these pictures to some people on a test they will always think oh yeah this feels like home this feels good the reason is it is a landscape that we come from long 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 time ago the savanna in africa our relatives, they lived and still live in the jungle. Huh? You know whom I'm talking about? Our closest relatives in, uh, from a perspective of evolution, they still live in a forest. But for us, that decided for whatever reason to get up and walk, um, the forest is not the most comfortable area to live in. Let's have a look at this clock. This clock is telling us something very unique. If our planet, the history of our planet would be 24 hours, then you see here on the top that the human beings appeared just 48 seconds ago in this 24 hours. There we are. And if we look at the time of our existence here, then we see to the left of your screen, the three billion before Christ that we showed up in a kind of till 10,000 before Christ. This is the period where we lived without settlement, where we wandered and walked around to find our food, to catch our food. And the much longer on the scale, the much longer period, it looks graphically on the scale much longer, it's much shorter. It's just 10,000 years that we are building houses, that we settled down and uh, that we have a place that it's called home. So the most of the time humans, and this is also into our genes, were walking. And they were walking and still some people, still in our days, keep this kind of tradition or this way of living. Talking about the Aborigines in Australia, they 
came to Australia, we know more or less about 20,000 years ago. And let's say till 100 years ago, they were really living this life. And they walked all over. They even call it sometimes a walk about. And that means that in a daily um, measure, in a daily yeah, average, they walk to get their food, to collect it or to catch it, um, to hunt it. It took them 10 to 12 miles. That's the average they walk. And that's also an average that is a comfortable average to walk also for us. I know what I'm talking about because I went on several long distance walks or pilgrimages. And here's an image of a pilgrimage because in our history and our tradition, also Christian tradition, the pilgrimage is something that um, is really connected to society, our development. And it's a, it's a thing that it's a walking, going on a distance, taking a time out from your regular life and making, getting in a, in a spiritual experience. These are two connections that in our days, a lot of people try to find again, because it was never ever before so popular, apart from the medieval times, for example, to go on a pilgrimage to Santiago de Compostela. You see it on your screen there to the left. It's in the north west of Spain. It's uh, where St. James or St. Jacob is buried. And every year, more and more people, around 300,000 people last year, made it to go there, to went on the way. Usually it takes you six weeks to go there. You see here a statistic that shows how in the last uh, 30 years, the numbers of people really increased to go on this pilgrimage, which should if you have a religious background, bring you to God, but it brings you also to yourself. No one that goes on that walk, it's not because it's so beautiful, but no one who takes a walk like this comes back as the same person. As well, in other religions, yeah? So uh, we all have heard about the Hajj, the way once a Muslim in, the life, in their lifetime should go to Mecca. Um, the most of the people as well in Santiago de Compostela will not make the whole way from back home to go there. But there is the idea behind it to walk at least a certain distance at the end. You should walk. You should arrive there definitely on foot. Or in India, even bigger festivals there at the River Ganges. And in other religions like in the Himalaya region, to go to the holy mountain of Kalesh and walk seven times around it. Once in your lifetime, you have to do this and it will change your life. Back to Germany and to our history, to our language. To your right hand side, you see a genealogical tree by chance or not by chance. I choose this one, which is a tree of humanity. And also there you see just at the top, there is man. So it's not really, the roots, it's not the trunk, it's one leaf up there on evolution. But that's not the reason why I put it there. I want to talk about the names of a trunk, of a tree trunk here. That's the Baum Stamm. Baum, tree, trunk. And the other thing there, the genealogical tree, is a Stamm Baum. And this all has to do also with Stamm. And a Stamm is a tribe. This, for example, is my tribe. And then some other similarities where our language, the German language, talks about our background, where we come from, because we come from the forest. The Germans belong to the forest. So we have the leaf over there, which is called a blood. But a blood is also a page. Yeah? It's a sleeve. And um, the newspaper, the real newspapers at the beginning very often were called Tageblatt, also modern ones, Tageblatt, the day uh, sleep, the day paper. Yeah. And uh, our history has said we come from the forest. The forest at that time 
when we were discovered or mentioned for the first time by the Romans, because we had not a written language in Germany uh, 2000 years ago, but the Romans had. So the Romans wrote something about Germania. Huh? They called us like this. And then later on, after the first conflicts with the Romans, when they found out, ah, oh, this really wild tribes there in the north, you better not mess around with them. Huh? But then came Christianity. Around 850, a monk uh, missionary came from Ireland and he brought Christianity in a kind of a rude way. So not in really, hey, yeah, let's become Christians. No, he used an example and he is there with the ax in his hand and he is cutting down our holy tree because we had like a pantheon, a pantheon of gods and one was living into the oak tree and this oak tree was cut by this monk and he proved with this that our god would not do any revenge to him he cut down the dona oak tree the oak tree can be found here in the north of europe we have unfortunately less and less and dona you might have heard about him the one the god with the hammer huh? avengers four he is our Nordic God that lives in the oak tree. And uh, he's called Dona, which is our word Donna, and gives the name to the day Donnerstag, this Thor, Thunder, Thursday. We have also female goddess. And this one is Freya. She lives in the trees that are close to the water, the water, it's the cradle of life, so it makes perfectly sense. Her trees are different ones, and her name is Freya. And Freya gives the name to the day Freitag, your Friday. This is where the names for our days are coming from. She lives in the elder tree, or in the Ulme, which is the elm. Or the one that I like a lot is the elderberry the whole lunda it's a it's a saying in germany when you build a house one thing you should do then first because before you move into the house is plant the elderberry bush close to the house this is an old tradition in germany and another old tradition and the saying is something that when you hear the thunder coming and still in our days even younger people remember at least parts of this we have a saying when the thunder is coming and you try to find shelter from the lightnings, then it is said, Eichen sollst du weichen, weiden sollst du meiden, buchen sollst du suchen, wenn du Linden nicht kannst finden. In a simple way it says, stay awake from oak and willow trees, look for beech and linden trees. It really works. Try to remember this. Next time thunderstorm is coming, look for a beech or linden tree. Then another thing in our language that uh, I guess I was 35, something like this, that I found out not on my own, but that I heard it for the first time. And I was really like, oh my gosh, that's true. Our letters are called Buchstaben. Very strange. No connection to any other language. But Buch is Buche, is beech tree. And Stab is stick. So it's simply beech sticks. Comes from really the use of our old, let's call them medicine man, who made out of beech wood sticks, little sticks with so-called runen, like letters, like symbols on it, and they used it for a kind of an oracle. So throwing it down and thinking about, okay, is it a good time to go for the hunt? Uh, will it rain in the next days? Should we plant now the wheat or not? Should we wait another week? So Buchstaben comes directly from this. And then uh, in our language, and in the romantic way, we think this is how the Germans live. This is how German countryside look like. Upper Bavaria does, sure. We see here all the towns and the villages that are connected with wild forest. 
Okay, I found some more, to be honest, and I found more, and I found more. I will not show you all of them. It's more than 600 towns and villages in Germany that have in the name something with forest, with Wald. So it shows where we come from. And uh, another thing that Americans also are aware of and the rest of Europe as well sometimes, latest through uh, uh, Disney is and are the fairy tales. Yeah. They are in the forest. They always have the background. They play in the forest. The story goes on in the forest. It's about getting lost and found. It's about hiding. It's about fear. It's about deep emotions. So in the forest for us um, lies the secret, lies the mystic thing, lies the magic thing. I like this one here of uh, Red Riding Hood and the wolf because the wolf is not really looking so bad. She's talking to the world. So talking to the things you usually don't get to see, the things that are bigger than life, the nature, where we belong to all these things finds a kind of a mirror in the fairy tales, in the legends, in nature. It makes a little one like the little brave tailor become such a hero that he makes it to win against the giants. Huh? So also in case when we think we are completely lost and the darkness comes around us, it is also like, uh, like the uterus, the, the forest is keeping us inside and is giving a home to us. It's dark, sure. And it's the place where we also try to make our living, try to make our living in the way that it was getting difficult, let's say from the last thousand years, because thousand years ago, there was the establishment of landlords and of landowners. Let's say the chiefs of the tribes became the owners of the land. From then on, it was forbidden for the normal people to go hunting. But we had very bad years and centuries and decades, so people were starving from hunger. But it was strictly forbidden for regular people, farmers or whatever, to go to the forest to hunt, to get and catch something for their family to feed them drastic, drastic uh, um, kind of repressions were on this. And you could even in the worst time even get executed by this. So the relation to a forest was very often also a difficult one. It was the forbidden part which belonged to the landlord. Then we are coming to the time when Vandalus, now we come back to this, comes into the presence of our society. It's a year about 1871. Germany gets united and a new country needs symbols. A new country needs a background where they come from, where they belong to, who are our heroes, what is our culture. And this is the time when Germany builds the most majestic monuments of our history, like Hermann, the one that was fighting against the Romans 2000 years ago in the forest. There is the goddess of Germania. This shows how big we are, where do we come from, how beautiful. But also, also, don't get me wrong, there's also the curiosity to look over the border, because in the south, the weather is so much better. So Italy becomes a destination at that time with the development of trains. Now we can travel to Italy and then go on a walk in Naples at the Roman ruins in Rome, whatever, because we are curious. We Germans like to go out. It's in our blood. Yeah? It's in our genes. We like to take a walk about. And so, um, this is what we do. Anytime we have the time we do so, the workers also at the weekend because it's the time when the cities are growing and it's a time of industrialization. We talk about 1900, the cities were terrible, full of smoke, full of dust, full of pollution. So at the weekend to get some fresh air, to breathe, to sing, the young generation and the older, they went out, they went out to the countryside. Here they 
they build it also kind of foundation clubs. Wandervogel, the wandering bird, was founded directly here in my neighborhood where I'm sitting now in Berlin Steglitz, 1896, still kind of existing. So people enjoyed the company of others. I mean, that's the time when you can meet girls and boys without being around it and surrounded by all the neighbors. You know, everyone is watching out from the window what is going on in the street. There you are in the forest, beautiful. Yeah. And it continues, it is used and also abused, sure. The propaganda of Hitler in 1933 adopts these ideas of, yeah, the forest, we Vikings, we Germans, her, 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 Christianity, forget it. We march now. It's not more so much hiking, it's marching. It's in uniforms, it's the Hitler Jugend, and it's their Bund Deutsche Mädchen, the Association of German Girls. Um, you don't smile that much anymore. It's an order, it's really strict, and at least the boys over there, just a few years later, they go on a big hike, on a big walkabout. They march towards Paris, they march towards Moscow, towards Stalingrad. And they walk back, like my father walks back from Siberia. That's a different side of walking. So after the Second World War, the people want to live a normal life. The cities are destroyed, so at the weekend, when there is the time, the first time for a little bit off, they go again to the countryside. And the good thing is, for this, for going spazieren gehen, for walking, you don't need any money. Maybe you need a train ticket, which is affordable in Germany, to go out from the city and then start your walk. You meet your friends, you take a little picnic with you, it's fun for free. Yeah. And this is what happens in the 1950s, 60s, and this is how people then enjoy the family, the picnic, the weekend, and this is how it creates in Germany, but in all over Europe, a really a system of hiking trails. Here we have a map that shows the main hiking trails, the international long distance hiking trails in Europe. Here we have a look at the German hiking trails. Mm, looks not so impressive. You might think, oh, I thought there would be more in Germany. Okay. We take also the hiking trails that would lead you to Santiago de Compostela. So all these ways here through Germany are getting you to this pilgrimage site I was talking at the beginning of. And these are just the official hiking trails in Berlin. And what I'm talking about, a hiking trail, uh, yeah, we have a lot of streets. No, a hiking trail means it's all marked. It is all signed. There's an infrastructure that you even cannot get lost. You don't need a GPS for this. You just follow the arrows and the signs and you follow this purple line through Berlin. And altogether, ladies and gentlemen, 190,000 miles, 300,000 kilometers of hiking trails, signed hiking trails we have in Germany. The forest, the German forest, this is how it idealistically would look like. Uh, it is not like this. It is since 200, 300 years, not anymore like this, because it has all been chopped off, cut down, industrial revolution, industrialization. There was to produce steel, was used charcoal, so even more cutting down and replanting by fast growing um, needle trees. This means any monoculture that you have in agriculture gets kind of weak towards any diseases. And this is how our forest then finally looked like, especially in the 1980s when we had acid rain but it's not over. Here we see a statistic, it's in German, about how our forest really got influenced by these uh, environmental diseases and changes. And you see the lines are not going down anymore. It was a little bit a break in between, let's say the year 2010, our forest looked really quite good, but it's going down again because now we face something else. We face global warming and our trees are just suffering from not getting enough water anymore. So uh, already in the 1980s in Germany started 
together with the movement, the peace movement against all these nuclear weapons in the east and in the west of Germany on both sides. It started with a strong movement, especially of young people. Yeah? This is a photograph from East Germany because also there by the pollution of the industry of the brown coal of the use of this it was getting really really bad so we understood immediately what we need to survive on this planet is our trees trees are filtering the air trees are there to stop erosion trees if the trees are gone we will be gone this is a movement that started 1980 with the first Green Party, don't get me wrong, I think in the world, eh? this party, the Green Party now, at the last elections, general elections in Germany in 19, uh, no, sorry, in 2019 for the European Parliament, became the second strongest party in Germany after the Christian Democratic Union of Angela Merkel, the second strongest party elected was the Green Party. I don't agree with anything that they do because they became quite... <sighs> a little bit lazy but still this movement is going on and you all know this how it influenced also our time yeah the friday for future the new generation and i have hope and i have faith in it that they will continue for this yeah? and they will continue to save our forest to replant it to do something for our nature but the best thing we can invest into our future and into our forest are our children and we have something in Germany since the 1970s. It was not our idea. It came from Scandinavia. And it's called Forest Kindergarten, Wald Kindergarten. That means these children are not going into a kindergarten, into a preschool where there is a house or whatever. They are all year long, 365 days apart from Christmas and holiday and whatever, out in the forest yeah, with two or three teachers. And they do everything, they discover everything from three to six before they come to school in the Waldkindergarten. I was honored and blessed uh, to work in a nature protection center and there I was following one year uh, through the season, this kindergarten, I photographed them, I made an exhibition about them together with them. It was really a pleasure. And what I found out doing research is that when these kids come to school, when they are six years old, they are much ahead of the other kids that go to regular kindergartens, not only in social behavior and creativity and these things, also in mathematics, in, in, in these kind of things. So, um, this is almost the end of my show and it's almost the end of my lecture so far. So I really enjoyed it to have you, even if I can't see you, can't hear you, but I hope you are outside there. And I want to finish my last lecture with something that I also at the end of my tours, when I hopefully in the future travel again as a with guests, that I always leave as a, as a last command. And I developed this something for myself, three questions, how to evaluate a society. Traveling around the world, traveling through Europe and looking at places, I came to this solution. You can give a definition how educated a society is by how are women treated. The second question you should ask, how are minorities treated? And to me, also very important, how are the animals treated? And then if you bring this together, you can see on what level your society, the neighbors, this tribe over there, this country over there is. And uh, to me, there's something else. And this comes back to wanderlust and to nature and to environment is, if you want to travel to a country and you think about, hmm, how is this country? Or maybe you want to study there, maybe you want to move there, you might ask, how is the crime rate? What is the regular income? You know, how is the weather there? You might ask questions like this to find out what's the quality of living there. I guess the old, old, ultimate question to ask is, do they have forest kindergarten? And if you can answer the question with yes, go there, go there. It's a cool country. It's a country where living is good. Thank you very much. I will finish with my regular phrase, which is stay healthy, stay human, and watch out for the signs. Thank you very much. <laughs>